And first of all, I would like to invite uh, Bartłomiej Kozek from Unabrit uh, Poland to, uh, uh, to start his uh, presentation. Yeah, the presentation is now on and um, uh, I think everything is working. The microphone is on, the camera is on. Uh, you're on, the floor is yours, Bartłomiej. Thank you, thank you very much and thank you for the invitation. Uh, well, we'll be talking about the European context uh, right now because it's a really important and relevant uh, context in terms of thinking about both sustainability, ecology, climate change and also the circular economy as well because these uh, issues are intertwined with each other and I will try to uh, talk about it a bit more in my presentation. Uh, just to give you a, a short information about who we are, uh, we are an NGO working since uh, 1991 in Poland, promoting the work of UN Environmental Program. And I've seen in the previous presentation that there were some illustrations, for example, from the uh, publications of the International Resource Panel, also created by UNEP. So it's really nice to see that the, the work coming from UNEP's, uh, UNEP and its affiliate structures is also uh, seen and promoted and seen as a relevant and important source of knowledge about the state of the global environment. So this is what we are also doing here in Poland, promoting the work of uh, UN Environmental Program in various ways, including uh, taking part in discussions and conferences uh, such as this one. Uh, so my name is Bartłomiej Kozak and I'm the Sustainable Development Specialist in the UNEGRID Warsaw Center. And for me, one of the most important issues to, uh, with which I come uh, and discuss environmental issues is their holistic approach. Uh, the, the approach that incorporates also social and in uh, economic thinking in terms of uh, environmental protection. It's something I've been working before this current job and at my job currently, because one of the sources of knowledge and one of the sources of actions uh, of which you may be aware of are the sustainable development goals and as you can see these are 17 sustainable development goals created promoted uh, by the united nations and these are the goals that uh, aim uh, to give purpose and meaning towards the development uh, work of economies and countries across the world these are not uh, goals that are limited purely for example to the global south as the previous uh, millennial development goals were, but these are, are goals that are meant to guide the whole humanity till 2030. And it's important also to note that they themselves uh, show the, the need for a holistic approach. I will be talking about climate change, but you can already see relevant issues regarding sustainable cities, regarding responsible consumption and production, which is also directly uh, directly connected to the idea and practice of circular economy. So you can't have one, just one goal without the other because uh, creating uh, this, passing a single goal without passing others does not mean sustainable development. So it's also important to bear that in mind and I will be uh, showcasing this further on. Uh, so one of the sources uh, of uh, information, the, the trends that guide global development, the guide global policies enacted or discussed at the national and global levels is the climate crisis. And uh, you can see the scale of the challenge on this uh, symbolic bar. This, each bar in this, this uh, scheme shows a single year. And the blue bars are the ones, uh, this is, per, I think, the bar for, for Poland. The blue bars show the years in which the temperature in a territory was lower than the, the average for the whole century or even a bit further. And the red ones are the ones in which the average temperature in a single year was warmer than the, the average for this century. And it clearly shows that with each year we are uh, coming right from the past to the present, the temperature is getting warmer and warmer. This is a source, uh, this is a connected 
to uh, anthropological challenges and uh, the issues regarding industrial uh, revolutions, uh, using more and more fossil fuels uh, for humanity's development, which gave us unprecedented levels of development, but also created a new trend, a new negative trend that is the uh, rise of the average global temperature. And there are uh, quite a lot of a series of uh, studies regarding them, uh, regarding this issue. And uh, right now, the scientific consensus is that we need to limit the growth, the average growth of the global temperature to 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, in comparison with these pre-industrial uh, levels. And uh, currently, as we can see, we are already uh, having a temperature that is 1.1 degree warmer than this pre-industrial age. And it already can be seen that it's uh, this rise of temperature is not a thermostat. Uh, we just turn the dial and it's a bit warmer. It shows that the equilibrium that was uh, a part of the global ecosystem is starting to shift and starting to change. And uh, the whole ecosystem is starting to maybe not disintegrate, but uh, working way uh, in a much more unpredictable manner. And basically, each and every year, we hear about unprecedented either weather patterns or uh, other serious issues regarding, for example, uh, bushfires in Australia, fires in the Amazon, fires in California, uh, California like this year. So there are changes that we can see and they already influence not only just the state of the environment, but also human well-being. They have a huge economic toll uh, and they have uh, uh, radi radically uh, lessened the quality of life of people affected, like if you can see an orange, uh, the photos of orange skies in California, then you can see that, well, it's not normal and you wouldn't want to live in a, in such a world. So it's important to note this because uh, most of the human activities currently are still based on fossil fuels uh, and packaging is sadly no different, but it also offers an opportunity of change. But in order to change, we need to know about the scale of this challenge and the scale of this challenge is unprecedented in terms of like uh, humanity itself. Uh, UNEP creates each year a, a report, the emissions gap report, and we can see that with current um, contributions of different member states of the UN arguing that they will limit CO2 and other greenhouse gas emissions by X, you would have a global warming of three degrees and it's way past this 3.2 to be exact and this is way past uh, the the limit the 1.5 threshold even the two point uh, uh, the, the uh, threshold the two degrees celsius warming that was the consensus previously so in order for us to limit the amounts of greenhouse gas emissions coming not only from the energy sector we need to also uh, Rem remind ourselves about that because emissions are not only from the energy sector, they also come from transport, buildings, uh, from the industry and also even from agriculture. Uh, and the scale of this challenge is unprecedented and the more we uh, wait for this challenge to go away, but it won't, uh, the less time we have for this challenge because for example, as UNEP shows, if we would start uh, concrete climate action uh, in the last decade, uh, then we would need to limit the greenhouse gas emissions uh, per year just by 3.3% uh, each year. But we didn't. So the, as you can see, the greenhouse gas emissions rose. It rose uh, more or less 1.5% per year. It's an average. And thanks to that, uh, right now, if we would want to limit the global uh, rise of uh, the average temperature to 1.5 degrees, we would need to cut emissions by 7.6% each year. It's a huge challenge. Uh, the current pandemic shows that it, uh, radical change is possible because 
uh, current uh, current estimates show that maybe we had a drop in CO2 emissions by 8%. But we can also see that if we do this in a rapid way, because we need to save ourselves from the pandemic, then of course it's not the ideal quality of life uh, in a default setting that we would like to see for us in the future. So it's important uh, to plan and to think about the future. And I will be talking about ways in which uh, the, uh, the European Union also plans to incorporate it in, its, uh, in the, the policies that it enacts or plans to enact. But before we do that, we need to also think about uh, other ways in which we can act. And these uh, different types of partnerships, public-private partnerships, partnerships between businesses, partnerships of global cities, can also uh, be a way uh, uh, through this crisis because uh, being the climate avant-garde can create either market niches for the companies that uh, take part in climate-friendly activities. Uh, they can, of course, influence uh, their PR and their, uh, the way the consumers see them because we know that not only in Poland, and even it's more, even more uh, visibly seen in uh, Western Europe or in North America, the environmental awareness of people is starting to rise more and more, and they want to have a uh, high quality of life without harming the environment or harming it as less as possible. So these partnerships show the leaders of the climate uh, change in their respective sectors, either the business sector or, for example, the city sector. And even we in the UNEP Grid Warsaw Center are promoting such a partnership that is climate leadership. We had a first edition this year and first 10 companies decided to partake on a very wide range of uh, climate friendly activities from uh, make using more recycled uh, material in their packaging. Uh, so up to um, promoting, uh, giving second life to mobile phones by giving them back to a company uh, and uh, the company could, for example, reuse it, resell it or recycle depending on the quality of the mobile phone. But besides the business sector and the city sector, it's really important to also bear in mind that it's not just a, a fashion, the care about the environment. We know that the environmental awareness roles, even from the 70s uh, in the 20th century, and especially after the last crisis, the financial crisis of 2007 and 8, there is a huge uh, push towards incorporating environmental protection with economic development, not only growth, because there is a huge discussion about limits of growth and whether or not growth as itself is sustainable in the long term. I won't, I won't venture into that, but in terms of incorporating the environment and the economy to create a green economy that's also socially just. So if you can see, there were works of think tanks such as the British New Economics Foundation, even in 2008, thinking about the Green New Deal. This is one of the terms that currently is quite fashionable, especially in the United States. We've seen work of uh, UNEP, we've seen school strikes and especially the climate youth that are really uh, going to the streets and wanting a better life for themselves and wanting this change that also incorporates uh, uh, creating new sustainable com consumption and production patterns. So let's see what Europe is doing currently. And we know that the most important uh, uh, umbrella under which these new environmental activities are performed is the European Green Deal. It's also important to notice that after 2019, the European elections we've seen in many countries of Europe, not all of them, of course, but in quite a lot of them, a sort of green wave in which parties that were more environmentally conscious and ambitious gained seats in the European Parliament. And also, a new European commissioner, Ursula von der Leyen, uh, the chair of the European Commission, embarked on an ambitious strategic, strategic vision uh, that 
on the one hand tries to incorporate climate science as you can see uh on this uh, this uh, this slide you can see the uh the ipcc report after which the climate movement regained its strength in recent months and also it turned out that uh, the new european commission decided that uh, creating sustain a sustainable economy on the continent wide scale is one of their priorities. So we now know that one of the priorities of this commission is to create a, uh, uh, to reach the goal of climate neutrality of the European Union until 2050. But also it is really important to notice that it, these are not like new things that the European Union has had uh, environmental policies from quite a long time regarding air quality, uh, regarding trying to incorporate some environmental standards in the common agricultural policy, because right now this is one of the elements of a huge debate over the directions in which this policy also needs to go uh, for the future. But we see on the one hand, there are facts. And on the other hand, these are uh, activities that uh, the European Union wants to pursue and even uh, they were announced, for example, at COP25 summit, climate summit in Katowice in 2018, uh, a wide range of activities amongst which we can see a circular economy as a really important factor in limiting the, the, the emissions, because if we create products that are uh, more energy efficient, then we limit the use of fossil fuels. If they are more uh, 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 resource efficient, because this is another part of the equation, then we also uh, have less environmental destruction and less fossil fuel uh, use and therefore less greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, joining different parts of the the policy sector and the policy spectrum is a really important part of thinking in terms of the European Green Deal. In recent weeks, we've heard about um, uh, an idea of a, reno a renovation wave in Europe uh, to thermal insulate buildings, residual buildings, for example. And you can see that these policy policies are not in a silo. When we think about buildings, we think just about buildings. When we think about agriculture, we think just in terms of agriculture. These there is a huge policy integration for the need uh, of sustainable development, and it's a really important goal uh, and a really important thing to have in mind. So, as I said, climate neutrality by 2015 is one of the goals. We are also having a discussion about raising the uh, emissions uh, reduction uh, goal to 2030. It was on 40%. Uh, uh, last year, we were thinking about 50, 55%. Recently, there was a vote in the European Parliament in which the Parliament asked for a 60% reduction, like we're saying about uh, in the span of 10 years. So these are ambitious goals. Uh, they will be a challenge for some economies. But on the other hand, as we've seen in the discussions regarding regarding the current multiannual financial framework for the future, for the post-corona fund, uh, the climate issues and the financing of climate issues and climate uh, investments up to the fund for just transition is a huge element of uh, of uh, European thinking right now. And there will be tons of policies that are, are either currently uh, worked at or uh, are planned or even were, uh, were published already uh, that will be relevant for the cir circular economy sector, will be relevant al also for the packaging sector. And I think, for example, the European Union industrial strategy the idea of creating a border adjustment tax, uh, the strategy uh, regarding the chemical sector are all documents that are, are policy proposals that are planned and will have a huge uh, influence on A, the ways of thinking in terms of sustainable development and B, will probably translate to more or less ambitious 
um, climate policies and policies that will have influence on the industry. Of course, uh, the European Commission has its plans, the European Parliament has its ambitions. In the end, it will be a sort of a compromise between these institutions and nation states. But we need to know that this is the direction. And it's important also for the industry to know that this is not just a fad. And after a few months, the European Union will say, no, nah, this was boring and let's start something else. This will be a trend that will be influencing businesses and their be behavior for years to come. And even before, before the European Green Deal, we had uh, we had really important policy announcements and str strategy announcements that that showed this uh, quite directly. Because, for example, in 2018, if I'm correct, there was a EU bioeconomy strategy, and this wasn't the first bioeconomy strategy. There was a previous one earlier in the decade, and as you can see. Uh, there is a view of showing that the bioeconomy can be a source of economic development, of creating new jobs and creating a competitive industry, competitive European industry that can compete on the global scale with other uh, business actors from around the globe. So as even in such a strategy, you can see this integration, the spirit of sustainable development. It's not only about creating new products that are uh, environmentally friendly, although it's of course a very important thing to have in mind, but it's also a opportunity to create new jobs, which may be especially right now important after the post pandemic recovery, which hopefully, uh, let's hope it will happen uh, as soon as possible. And of course, the important issue of fossil fuels, not only in the environmental terms, but also in terms of uh, energy import. Um, uh, the fact that Europe is energy dependent, it needs to import mainly uh, the fossil fuels it uses. So reducing fossil fuel use is not only important in terms of fighting the climate crisis, but also in terms of uh, creating a sense of uh, even economic security, because also we are now uh, more and more thinking about uh, terms of uh, uh, not only in terms of competitiveness, but also in terms of safety, even in terms of uh, reshoring some industries such as the medical sector back to Europe, which will be a challenge, but it's already starting to be discussed during this pandemic, which, as we've heard, uh, changes quite a lot of things. And the bioeconomy is especially uh, important for the European Union because it's a source of jobs, it's a source of added value, it's a source of a large turnover. We can see it employs 18 million people across the continent, across the European Union. And uh, if we see the bio-based chemicals and pharmaceuticals, plastics and rubber, this is a relatively small sector in terms of employment, but it creates proportionately quite a lot of value added in terms of the European economy. For example, if you compare it with uh, with the agricultural sector, which is way bigger in terms of employment, but does not create as much proportionately value added as, as the bio-based chemical sector, for example. And even in this bioeconomy strategy, the European Union showcased uh, examples of such a bioeconomy of the future, especially the ones that were financed by the European Union. And one of them is the Res Urbis project, which uses, for example, organic waste to create bioplastics and bio uh, bio uh, plastics that can be used in, for example, in packaging. So it's a really different uh, way of, uh, of it's a way of using alternative materials that can be uh, less harmful to the to the climate and to the environment, but still offer the the benefits of packaging that we were discussing earlier during this uh, during this uh, the introductory speech. And of course, there is a EU plastic strategy, and and it also uh, is an important thing to think about, not only in terms of what it does because it's aimed at limiting the use of single-use plastics uh, or to promote recycling, as we know. But on the other hand, it's really important in terms of uh, 
how it's been developed. It showed how policy changes can become quite rapid and uh, also the industry needs to be prepared for them because this were a part of a social uproar after one of the documentaries, I think that was from David Attenborough showing the, uh, the scourge of plastics in the oceans uh, that were dumped in the oceans and what it did to, uh, to wildlife. And it showed that in a few months, the policy towards plastics and the push towards making them more sustainable can be a very powerful policy tool. And I would say that part, at least part of the industry was taken by surprise uh, by it. And so it's really important to know that th this will not be a patient wait in which we will like transform in a matter of like years and we will just uh, adapt by using a bit promoting a bit more recycling there is a huge push and a huge huge need to change these production and consumption patterns uh, also coming from the consumers and just blaming consumers for for their uh, the ways of whether or not they are recycling uh, can be a double edged sword because the consumers may get furious from for the industry and its practices so it's really important to to bear that in mind, also in terms of purely, purely economic profit and uh, in terms of uh, uh, the way in which uh, people and consumers see, uh, see such sectors as uh, plastics produce, uh, production, for example. And this all leads us to the idea of the circular economy itself, which shows that uh, for years we have been thinking about uh, recycling but we need to get more and more ambitious we need to rethink what do we need to package at all how can we package it how can we uh, produce these packages how can we design these packages to be as much efficient as possible how to use alternative um, resources how to do... there is a, of course a need for experimentation. Sometimes the the ones that are experimenting will fail. Sometimes the ones that will be experimenting will have huge successes. It's important because, for example, when we were talking about the EU plastic strategy, there was the whole issue regarding uh, oxybiodegradable plastics, which theoretically are degradable, but because consumers not all, uh, always knew the fact that they're, of course, degradable, but only industrial uh, facilities, then uh, the whole issue regarding uh, plastic pollution still was visible. So there will be a lot of work to do. There is a real need for the EU also to help it, not only in terms of policy, but uh, financing such projects as the Resurbis one with, uh, of, about which I was talking about. But right now, recently, we've seen a circular economy action plan. And like you can see, uh, it's focusing on reducing over packaging. It's re, uh, focusing on uh, redesigning. Uh, it's focusing on recycling. So it's focusing on the whole circular economy package, not only in terms of recycling, but also in terms of um, the harm towards the environment uh, coming from unsustainable plastics production and consumption also by uh, consumer use. But it's also focusing on opportunities coming from the bio-based plastics, uh, from biodegradable or co compostable plastics, especially the, one, the ones that are not uh, creating the microplastics problem. And it, of course, tries to show the opportunities in terms of jobs, in terms of uh, competitiveness of the industries and the, the companies themselves that are uh, uh, that would benefit from this change if it would happen on a wide scale. So we will need climate leaders, and that's something with which I would like to leave you. And I'm very grateful for having this opportunity to talk to you. And if you have any questions, then later on, uh, I could try to ask, uh, answer at least part of them. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to the second uh, presentation.